Well, I wanna start out with this message with one phrase. I want you to know something important about this whole life we live in, that there are two different kinds of people in this world. There are fence people, and there are non-fence people. Now you're like, no, really, seriously, you're gonna bring it all the way down. The whole thing of the world is gonna come down to this basic idea of fence or no fence. And I would say yes, that's exactly what it is. I like the idea of a fence. I am a fence person. As a matter of fact, my fence right now at home is falling apart, and it really bothers me. We had a quote of like $10,000, and we decided instead to fix our dog instead, which cost us $10,000 this last year. So my fence is, is a little bit uh, weary, but someday soon we'll get that done. But I am definitely a fence person. I like the idea of a fence. I like the idea of keeping danger and things out, and I like the idea of protecting the things that are in it. So I'm definitely a fence person. You have to ask yourself whether or not you are or aren't. So it's important for you to think about. But you know, the thing is, people don't really concern themselves about a fence very much until they think about the things that they love a lot of times, the things that they might want to protect. You know, a lot of times you might not think about putting up a fence until you have a dog or you have kids and you think, wow, I need to protect them now. I need to protect them from something that could come in and get them or protect them from getting out and getting hurt. So this is super important for us to think about. It's something that we need to become hyper aware of in our lives when it comes to your faith. This is super important. This is super important whether or not you believe that you are a fence person or a non-fence person, because I will tell you, one will help you to succeed in your faith, and one will cause your destruction if you don't. So during our faith, we have to remember that we live in this crazy world. We just talked about this, this idea, this crazy world that throws all this stuff at us all the time. Negativity, um, dangers, and we have to think about the ideas of how to protect ourselves when we live in this world. You know, the Bible tells us that, you know, we are going to walk through this world. It's, it's part of what we're going to do, but this is not our home. So how we succeed and make it through is going to make all the difference of whether or not we actually get to our true home someday. So, you know, the thing is, we have to go through some things. We have to go through some barriers, and we also have to set up some boundaries in our faith. It's super important for us to remember that. So barriers, obviously, are going to get in our way. We know that. We know that there's things going to be coming up that are going to trip us up, make us fall down. We have to dust ourselves off and get up again. And then we also have to have, like I say, those boundaries that we set inside of ourselves, these things that say are the uh, absolutes. I will not do this, or, you know, I, I, I will do this. These are the things that I'm going to do. So these barriers, these obviously, these difficulties in life, they come at us hard and fast, and what happens a lot of times is they kind of make us stumble. They kind of help us uh, to get our eyes off Jesus, and what we do instead is we start to worry, we start to be fearful, we start to have those things that, you know, obviously we think, you know, this is going to take, take me out. Or sometimes, sadly enough, that people really don't understand that sometimes these barriers come in these, what we think is a gift from God. Some of these things that we think they couldn't possibly not be from God, because look at this wonderful person that God has given me. And instead, God says, no, no, that was a barrier. <laughs> that was something that was going to trip you up. You just didn't see it. You didn't recognize it. So these things are going to cause us problems in our faith. These things are going to be the things that are going to either, like I say, we're going to succeed, we're going to make it, or we're going to fail, and we're going to fall short. You know, we have been given this amazing gift from God. You know, I think sometimes we really do lose sight of that. I think sometimes we just get caught up in our everyday life and, you know, we think, yeah, Jesus is good, God's good, I go to church, I do these things. But you ever stop and think, when you, when you really think about it, what he did for us, you understand your path was destruction. Your path was everlasting fire. If you did nothing, you were going to hell. That was it. Do you stop and think about the fact that he died in your place? He actually stood upon that cross for us. This is something for us to be mindful of. You know, I think we just make it become so every day, and we don't think about this that much. We don't think about the sacrifice he made. But this was like this amazing gift that he gave us, and he changed our destinies. He took us from death to life everlasting. 
If he does nothing else for us in our life, that was enough. And sometimes we really don't act like it was that important. We actually don't really even think about it sometimes. We get up, we start living our life, you know, we go through a little bit of troubles, a little bit of struggles, and we're like, you know, yeah, God is good. And we're like, no, God is great. He's done an amazing thing for us. And he still continues to give us gifts every day, despite just more than what he's done for us on the cross. I think it's sad because a lot of times we say that we're believers, we're followers, we, we live for God. But I think sometimes if we really looked at what we allow in, and what we allow to escape, sometimes God might be thinking, I don't know so much if that's really who you are. I think a lot of times people fall away. A lot of times because they just don't seriously take enough thought of what God has done. And about guarding this amazing gift he's given us. You know, if you love something, like I said, if you have a fence, you're going to guard the people that you love inside of it. Your faith should be so important to you. Your faith should be so important that you want to guard it, that you want to protect it, that you'll do anything you can to not let anything get in the way of what you're trying to do for God. I think a lot of times what we do is we simply let the enemy have access. We allow him free reign into our life. Or sometimes, sad enough, what happens a lot of times is we just get lured away by the enemy. We get lured away so easily. This world has a lot of shiny, bright things that catch our attention. And we get lured away. So it's really up to us to guard and protect our faith. You can't leave it up to anybody else. It's you and you alone that has to protect it. You know, we can do everything we can here on a Sunday. During, put things up on Facebook as, you know, a message or online. But it's up to you every day to get up and protect your faith. What gift you've been given from God, the sacrifice he made, it's up to you to protect it. We can't do it for you. You know, I just talked to my husband the other day because, you know, he does kids ministry on Sunday and I've done youth ministry for lots of years. And he said to me, it makes me so disappointed when I see people walk away. These kids that I, you know, we met somebody at a, you know, the other day that he used to come to kids' church, and he said, it makes me so sad that we lost her. And I said, you know, John, sometimes it's just that seed that you plant. It's just that seed. But I said, you've got to understand, we hit an hour. The world yells and screams at him all day long, every day. So I said, it's that fight that we have to fight. But a lot of times, they're not protecting their faith. I'm going to tell you as parents, doing youth ministry forever, man, you better be protecting your kids for a while because at first, they're not going to get it how much they have to protect it. The world is going to be screaming at them to walk away and not believe. But we can't leave it up to anyone else. What we do to to make it is we have to navigate those barriers that are going to come our way. And like I say, then set up those boundaries. They're going to keep the bad things out of our life and keep those good things from getting away from us. You know, a a barrier is a fence or obstacle that prevents movement or access. I'm sure if anybody has been a believer for long, you've met some barriers in your life. I know I have. I've, I've definitely met some barriers that were going to trip me up and cause me not to have movement towards God. It causes us to slow down and sometimes even stop those barriers when they come in our lives. A boundary is a line that marks the limits of an area. Obviously, it's something that we should set up so that we don't go too far. You know, that we don't go too far and we don't end up causing our own demise in our faith. When we don't put up a fence in our faith, I want you to understand we are just living ourselves open to the attacks of the enemy. We're we're dead meat. We're not going to make it. We have to understand that this is a literal fight to the death. And if you're not thinking of it that way, you are going to fail. I guard it with everything I can. I remember having young kids and saying, well, we're not going to do this, or we are going to do this. Trying to be aware of their lives, saying, no, no, you can't go here. You won't go there. Because I knew this is a life or death prospect. And I wanted with all my heart both of my kids to follow after God and make it. When we don't put up that fence in our, our, our life, Our faith walk, we are literally giving up and letting the enemy walk in. Do you believe that? 
See, this is where I think we kind of fail. I think that the church has really gotten, I think what you're saying, Cameron, is so true at the beginning. This is an interesting time. I think the church has been way too easy going. When the enemy is trying to do all this stuff, you know, we're always like, well, I don't want to get involved in that. People don't want to hear my, my opinion on that. You know what, God's opinion on that. We have gotten so quiet, and the world has gotten so loud, and we literally just keep letting people fall away and be destroyed. It's so important for us to remember that we live with an enemy, and we live in a world that does its bidding. You know, we have to fight. We have to fight for what we've been given. Peter 5.8 says, Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Think it's important to put up a fence? I do. I think it's real important to put up a fence. If you've got an enemy that is literally, if you had a real literal lion outside your door, what would you do to protect your loved ones? To protect you? You'd put up the biggest fence you could possibly put up. Yet we're given this gift from God and we don't protect it. We don't guard it. I, I think this is the reason why I wanted to teach this message so badly is because I really think so many of us that say that we're followers of God, we don't think like that. We don't think about protecting it. We don't guard it. We don't care enough. And I think the reason why I wanted to teach this is because I'm telling you, we got to step up. We got to care about our faith because especially if we have people that we actually are going to teach and lead through us. It's so important for us to remember. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided attention and, or devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. You know, I think what's interesting about the Bible is a lot of people look and say, Oh, all these unbelievers. No, no. The Bible is all about talking to people that say that they're believers. The Bible is filled with them talking to people that say they're devoted followers of Christ. And what it says is, he says, I fear somehow that your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. So what's happening today? So many people are saying that they're followers of God, but then when you look at their lives, man, they're really corrupted. They're falling away. All it took was a COVID, for many of them, a little bit of struggle. I'm gonna step on a few toes here. Can I just say this? How much do you listen to the government? How much do you listen to Jesus? I'm going to tell you, it's something to think about. How quickly we followed in lockstep with everything they said, but yet Jesus has been telling you things for a long time, and you haven't done none of them. I'm just telling you. In the 28 years of following after Jesus, I can tell you that I've seen far too many Christians underestimate the enemy and overestimate themselves. All the time. They're like, oh, no, you know, you know, you, God loves me. He's not going to allow me. It's like, really? God will do what it takes to get you where he needs to be. And I tell you, there's a lot of people walking around very, very prideful thinking, no, no, I can handle everything. It's like, no, you cannot. You need his help. And you need to stay faithful. I've seen with Christians constantly play with fire and think they're not going to get burnt. And eventually what happens all the time is they always burn up. They always burn up. They catch fire. They become blasé about their faith. They think they have it all figured out. They think they're strong enough. I can fight the enemy on my own. And I've seen them lose and lose and lose time and time again. You know how many people we would have if they would have been fighting the fight enough? How, we, would, we would be like three times. We'd be running six services. But I'll tell you, there's so many people that have just disappeared because they overestimated themselves and they underestimated the enemy. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. See, I think there's so many of us that think, no, no, I got it figured out. I can put in this much time. I can give this much sacrifice. I can give this much devotion and I'll be just fine. Not how it works. Their undoing is gonna come either because you're going to be too naive or prideful or both is what's going to take place. God's word when he tells us that there's a real enemy that we need to fight, that we need to protect ourselves from, we need to guard and protect ourselves and the people that we love. He says, this is so important. 
This is so important for you to be mindful of. These boundaries that we're not placing in our lives, these things, these absolutes that we're not setting up. This is where our undoing will be. Yet I've seen so many Christians never live with boundaries. They never put boundaries up in their life. They never guard what they've been given. They fall over and over again by all these barriers and these things that the enemy throws at them. A lot of times, like I said, believing that they're gifts, that they're going to be good. And then they fall apart. What always happens, too, is always interesting to me, is they're always surprised when things start to go badly for them. You know how many times I've had conversations with people that are like, you know, I don't understand. God just, it's like, well, I did. Truthfully, I told you. <laughs> you came up, you asked me, and I told you. This opposite sex, this person that you're with that you're not married to and you're having sex with, I'm just going to get real bold here, guys. <laughs> because I'm serious. I don't think we take it serious enough. I'm telling you, this person that's not your spouse and you're having sex with them, and then you come up and you tell me, you know, it's all going to work out. It's like, no, it will not. It is a matter of time before it fails. You know why? Because you're doing it out of order. And God said it. Yet you're always surprised. I thought this was the one. I could have told you it wasn't the one. You know why it's not the one? Because God wouldn't allow that to work that way. Because he has a standard and rules and regulations, and he tells us how to live it's just we're always thinking we're prideful. We are the exception to the rule. If I had a dollar for every one of those people, man, I'd be a millionaire. I'll tell you. Or those people that get a different job. And they think, oh, this job's going to be great. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to get more money. I'm going to start sacrificing more. And I'm going to get more to the church. And this is going to be so great for my family. And before long, the job has taken over everything. Before long, they're out of church, they're out of groups, and they're like, man, my faith's not what it once was. It's like, yeah, because you know what you did? You fed the wrong thing. You fed prosperity instead of your faith is what you were concerned about. Or there's those Christians that don't understand about boundaries as far as drinking and out carousing, doing those things like that. They mess up their lives by hurting themselves or others, their families, and then they're always surprised. Geez, I don't know why. Why didn't this work? Well, because you didn't do it the right way. God makes it clear if you read his word that drunkenness is a sin. Drunkenness is also weed, guys. Do you know? Anything that kind of messes and alters with your head. You know, there's not one thing in this life that God doesn't make clear from his word that's either going to help us or harm us. He makes it so clear if we read. He can tell us what the, the right path is and what the wrong path is, what we should avoid and what we should let in. Unfortunately, so many of us were so busy binging on Netflix that we don't spend five minutes or ten minutes listening to Daily. This is so important for you. You're, you're feeding the wrong thing. You're feeding the world. You're not listening to what God wants you to do. I can tell you... You're always trying to forge your own path. And God gave us the perfect one to walk on instead. So how do we make it? How can we guard this amazing gift that God gave us? How do we guard ourselves and how do we guard our families if you have kids and, and people that are around you? How do you guard it? And I think it's really interesting because we can go right back to the very, very beginning by following his rules. The to-dos, the to-don'ts, those things that he put in place, and those are the Ten Commandments. And I can tell you right now, if I did a quiz, if I did a quiz right now and I asked you what the Ten Commandments are, I would say that most of you would fail. We don't even remember the Ten Commandments. They're pretty simple. They're ten. Ten. Some of you guys know sports scores. Way better than that. You know all about cars. You know all about engines and guns and baking and... You know, the housewives of OC or whatever you're watching out there. <laughs> you know all about them. I could tell you a name. You're like, oh, yeah, I know that person. But you don't know the Ten Commandments. They're so important. You know, the thing is, they've never gone out of style, no matter what mainstream media or social media has told you. They have never gone out of style. No other God but him. 
Don't make idols out of anyone or anything and worship them. Don't misuse God's name. Observe a Sabbath. Thank you for you guys are here or you're watching online. You're doing that. This is great. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't be envious. I know all of you are out there thinking, Deb, 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 go back. Understand, that was the old covenant. That was the old. We live under the new covenant now. And you're right. But what you have to remember that when Jesus came, he didn't, get to, he didn't come to just abolish all those things. He came to amp them up, to make them even stronger. This is how he decided he was going to do it. He said, no, no, these are the things that you have to take care of. Not just, you know what, um, out in life, but also in your mind. He says, no, no, it's, it's bigger than what we were doing before. You know, the thing is, I heard a long, long time ago in my faith, starting out what they would say is, you know, whatever you do in your mind, you'll do in time. And I thought, that is so true. Whatever we fantasize, whatever we think upon, those things are what is our motivation. It's what we actually think about and want to do. You know, if you think about those 10 things that God says not to do and to do, there's still those things that really cause our, our help or our undoing. They're really not out of style at all. If you think about it, no other God but him. Now, we continually make gods out of our jobs, out of our money, out of our spouses, out of our kids. Kids, I'm telling you, some of you guys are worshiping your kids. Everything's all about your kids. Kids are great. I love my kids. I, they know I do anything for them. But I will tell you, God's first. God's first. Some of you guys worship those kids. Well, I can't go. Oh, well, you know what? Sally had a game. I couldn't, I couldn't go. Okay. Don't make idols out of anyone or anything and worship them, God says. Man, we can see by our thoughts and actions that it's all about other things. It isn't God. Even when you come here, are you too embarrassed to raise your hand to worship God? We worship a lot of things, but a lot of times we're not worshiping God. Don't misuse God's name. God's name is so disrespected today. So disrespected. It's a throw-around word. I mean, honestly, we use the word G-O-D constantly, don't we? No matter what we're saying. Oh, look at that. Oh, God. There's you know, a relevance. We're supposed to be, love God so much. We shouldn't have that thought. It's a cuss word. I never realized it was a cuss word so much until I went and worked at a grain elevator at fall one time. Whoa. Every other word was JC. I was like, I was kind of shocked. Because I mean, I heard cuss words. I grew up, I wasn't 28, I was 28 before I got saved, so I heard plenty of cuss words. But I didn't realize it was a cuss word, like every second. But the problem is we don't show reverence. We don't show reverence out of his name. Observe a Sabbath. Man, we have more excuses why we can't spend an hour in church. And I mean, more, more excuses. We can't take an hour out of our day. Well, it's rainy. Well, it's sunny. It's a nice day. I want to go out and have a picnic. Or, you know, it's too cold today. It's too hot today. You know, there's always something. Believe me, the enemy wants that. The enemy wants you to look at the weather. I mean, honestly, Christians, we worry about the weather more than we do Jesus Christ. For sure. Honor your father and mother. We definitely show a lot of disrespect to our moms and dads, how we talk to them, authority, you know, at all. Elders, those people who are important in our lives, those people that are older and maybe have some wise words, we kind of like, well, they're old. I can tell you they're old and they've gone through it. This is why there's a stool here today, because I said, I don't know if my leg, I keep having a numb right foot, and I said, can you put a stool here just in case? Because I'm old. I'm old. I'm your elder. I'm trying to tell you, I, don't walk away being beat down today. I'm telling you this because it's important, and God wants you to understand it. Don't walk away and say, you know, oh, Deb just thinks she knows everything. No, I've failed just as many times as you have, more so probably. But I've learned these things are important. Don't murder. Like I said, Jesus, when he came, he said, it's not just committing murder. When he came, he says, when you have murder in your heart, when we hate, 
When we hate everything, he says, if you have hate in your heart, you commit murder. I don't know about you, but this has been a time in my life that I'll tell you, I have thrown out the word hate more than I've ever have. I have. I've had to ask God, forgive me. I've done a lot of bad things, and I was talking to someone this morning. I said, man, I have never been so angry in all my life as I have lately. I had to really stop and think about what I'm saying when I say I hate that or I hate that person. God's word says it's murder. Don't commit adultery. Like I said, we live in a world today where vows mean nothing. Nothing. You can vow something and then in two seconds you can change your mind and say, well, the circumstances change. No, you made a vow. It's supposed to mean something. Don't steal. And we are so willing to take things that aren't ours. Even little things. I think it's always based on the idea that we deserve better or more. You know, well, I deserve it. I should get that. I'll just take it. We see that's throughout the world today. All over the place. Don't lie. Well, we've made acceptable little white lies all the time, don't we? To save our skins, to get ourselves out of trouble, instead of just accepting the punishment. You know, you leave, you leave work early and you know you're not supposed to, so what you do is you wait and say, hey, clock me out. It's a lie. It's a lie. A lot of times what we think is what they don't know won't hurt, won't hurt them, right? Well, God's paying attention. I remember telling my kids that when they were small. I said, listen, you can lie to me all you want. You can tell me every story. I'll probably believe you. But you always remember that God is watching He's paying attention to what you say and what comes out of your mouth. I put the fear of God in them. <laughs> I'll tell you. Doesn't hurt, guys. Doesn't hurt. I'm telling you, I have two kids that follow after God. It's worked. Little guilt never hurts. Um, anyway, don't be envious. The last one. Our entire world is based in envy right now. Envy, forever concerned what other people have and what we think we should have too. They get a new car. Well, I want a new car. Look at their house. Their house is better than my house. Look at her clothes. Look at her purses. She's got such nice things. I want, I want. Give me, give me. We're so envious. And I think God has to be up there sometimes just shaking his head. Thinking, you know, I made this really clear. Just really clear. Yet these people are always trying to live as close to the edge as they can. Always just ready to fall off the cliff, always flirting with danger, never acting as though you're going to be taken out. You know, there is that saying where God, you know, people save their old, their moms or dads would say, you know, listen, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. I want you to know something. God brought you into this world and he can take you out. No doubt about it. Listen, when we trip or we open ourselves up to attack, we have to be mindful of all those things. We have to think about the fact that God has a better plan for us, a way in which to live. You know, when we fail, what happens a lot of times, what we do is we lick our wounds and then what we say is, God, how did you allow this? How did you allow my life to fall apart so much? And he's like, man, it was all you. You did it. You did it. You know, the thing is what's great about God is that we have this God that doesn't force us to love him. You know, it's really, really great when you think about it. We don't have to be forced. I mean, right now, our government's forcing us to do everything. Isn't it great that we have a God that doesn't force us to do everything? We have a God that gives us freedom to love him, or even if you want to turn your backs on him. He gives you that freedom. It's all up to you. But he gave us these perimeters and these borders in which to live. But he says, I don't force you to follow him. It's up to you to follow them. And I think a lot of times we just use this freedom that he gives us to cause ourselves so much pain instead. We're, the, we're our own worst enemy so many times, the things that we do. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Yeah, you have the freedom. You can do it. He's saying, yeah, you can, but should you? Should you do it? You can, but it's not going to be good for you. 
It's not going to be beneficial for you if you do this. The problem that we don't remember, don't remember and be mindful of is this. It just says in 10, 23, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, it goes to 10, 24. The next phrase it says is, and don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Isn't that interesting? You know why? Because he knows that we're supposed to be mindful of the fact that everybody's watching us. They're all paying attention to us. When we call ourselves believers and followers of God, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be those that are salt and light. We're supposed to live life differently than the world does. He tells us there's always someone watching, always someone paying attention. You have to ask yourself if you're concerned that your actions are going to affect others around you, those that are watching and paying attention to your life. You know, if you're an, um, a believer and your husband or your spouse isn't, he's watching, she's watching. Your friends that aren't believers yet, but you say you are, if your life's no different, they're watching, they're paying attention. Your family members that you say you love and you want to reach, but yet you're no different, they're watching. Your kids, your kids, I'm telling you, your kids are watching what you do. They're going to emulate everything you're doing. How you get through a battle, they're going to follow that same path. They're going to see you try and escape life by maybe drinking too much or maybe focusing on the wrong things, maybe putting your job first, not prioritizing your faith, not keeping God number one. They're watching it. They're paying attention to it. Like I said, I was a failure in so many ways. I am so thankful that God turned my life around. And I'll tell you, he deserves so much more than what I gave him for so many years. You know, God is good, and he's patient, and he's kind, and he loves us. And he'll give you some time to work out all your barriers. All those things are going to trip you up. He'll give you some time. But eventually what happens is we're going to lose the passion to fight. We're just going to kind of like think, yeah, this is tough. It's much easier to just go with the way of the world. It's easier to just go that way. And it is. I could have given up on so many other things and said, no, no, I'm just going to go with the flow. The flow doesn't work. We have to forge a new path. We have to go our own way, the way that God says, very few are going to make it. Don't you want to be one of those few? I do. I don't want it to be where I'm left behind. I want to be one that's passionately in love with Jesus Christ, and I love him with all my heart. I can't imagine my life without God. On the way here today, when I was just worshiping, I was thinking, thank you. Thank you for taking such a messed up, screwed up person and loving me so much that you gave me a different path. Who I am today is nothing like who I was for 28 years. I take it back, probably 31 years, because I probably screwed up about three years of that, that I still didn't do right. To make it through those barriers, you have to ask yourselves, what are your standards? What's your standards in your faith? What are you going to put there? What are your I wills and I won'ts? What have you put in place? You have to ask yourself, are they set in stone? Or are they kind of vague? You know, are they fluid? Are they ever changing? Do they change with who you are with? When you're around certain people, do they change then? When you're in different circumstance, maybe they're real when you're at church, but then you walk out and you go in the world and they change. They have to be set in stone with what you believe and what you're going to live. To make it through and actually succeed and have people that are going to succeed around you, those people that you're actually called to reach, you have to be steadfast. That means unmovable. You have to like set up and say, I'm not going to allow this. I'm not going to allow the enemy to get me in this way. You're going to have to put up a fence and not let things get away from you. Well, I want to end with the words that Moses spoke to the Israelites after God had miraculously delivered them from slavery. When he showed himself to be faithful over and over and over again, just like he's done so many times for us, and I think it's words for us to surround ourselves with. 
and it's in Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. It's a little long, but it's awesome. Pay attention to it. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, which is what I felt like God wanted me to do today again, to go back and teach you them again. You must obey them in the land that you're about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all his decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts to your house and on your gates. What it's saying is that we need to remember those Ten Commandments. Like I said, many of us would fail if I asked you what they were. Think about them. Think about those simple ten commands that he gave us to follow. Talk about them. Talk about them if you have kids. Talk about them with your spouse. Talk about them with your friends and your family. Talk about these things and, and let them matter. That's how you're going to protect yourself. That's how you're going to become a fence person. Right? Keep the bad things from getting in and the good things from getting away. You have to decide for yourself what your standards are going to be. And you have to live your life in a way that you actually don't waver. Quit tripping up. Quit failing. Quit falling short. Be determined. Be passionate. I'm going to tell you, a lot of the enemies that you're going to have in your life are going to be slayed by worship. And I know everyone has those. Like, oh, we're just singing. No, no, you don't understand what worship is. Worshiping God, there are people that are healed through worship. There are people that, honestly, their faith is just grown and manifested in their lives by worship. It is amazingly important. And yet a lot of times what happens, we're like, you know, that whole singing thing, I'm just not good. You know what? I can't sing for the lick of me. People around me see that. They know I can't sing. But I'll tell you, I sing anyway, because it doesn't matter. My voice to God is beautiful, because I'm praising him. I want that for you. Stretch yourself. Praise God. Worship him. Seek his word. Put do's and don'ts in your life and just be bold in your decisions. This is what I want for you. Let me pray. God, I am so thankful that you are so good and you give us such simple things to follow. And Lord, we complicate them. We make them so undoable. And they are so doable if we just put you first. Lord, I pray for each person that's here, that's listening online, that watches this message. Lord, I pray that you would become so real in their lives, Lord, that they couldn't possibly see you when they get up in the morning, that they couldn't feel you, that their eyes would be set upon you, and that would be their focus on that day. Lord, I just pray that you would help us to succeed, help us to not fall apart and fall away and fall off the cliff and be those that are just gone. Lord, help us. We ask for your help. We put you first. We ask that you would just help us in this battle. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs>